let's talk a bit about bacterial toxins. These are molecules produced by various bacteria that alter the normal metabolism of host cells, and they are often responsible for the major symptoms of bacterial infection. And there are many different kinds of toxins that are produced, which we'll talk about briefly. Interestingly, this is in direct contrast to viral infections, in which very few viral toxins have been identified. They cause disease in very different ways from bacteria. Now, we recognize different classes of bacterial toxins. Some are called exotoxins because they are secreted by the bacterium uh, into the extracellular environment. These exotoxins shown on this picture have a typical AB structure. They have subunits, separate subunits, consisting of an A component and a B component. Typically, the way they work is they're secreted by the bacterium and they bind a receptor shown here in R on the surface of the eukaryotic cell, on the surface of R cells. They are then taken up into the cell by the endocytic pathway. And typically, the A component, which is the active component, is released from the receptor binding component, makes its way into the cytoplasm, where it then has its effect on cells. There's another class of toxins called the type 3 cytotoxins. They're shown on the right of the diagram, where we see an outline of a rod-shaped bacterium and what looks like a syringe injecting molecules into the host cell. Those are type 3 cytotoxins. They're directly injected into the host cell by a structure on the bacterium called a uh, secretory injection system. And these have evolved just to inject toxins into the cell. These secretory systems uh, act by in introducing molecules into cells to alter their behavior. Other toxins are produced by bacteria that act at the surface of host cells. Uh, some of them bind to pattern recognition receptors and induce the production of cytokines, which have lethal effects. There are also pore-forming toxins, which make holes in cell membranes uh, and make them die. And finally, there are toxins called superantigens that bind to T cell receptors and major histocompatibility receptors and induce the uh, synthesis of many, many toxic cytokines. And finally, there are proteins called exoenzymes produced by bacteria that modulate targets in the extracellular matrix. Let's look at toxins in a bit more detail. I mentioned that they typically have an AB structure the diphtheria toxin is, consists of one molecule of the A and one molecule of the B. Again, the B is the receptor binding component. The A is the effector portion that actually has an effect on the host cell. The diphtheria toxin, the A portion, blocks cell protein synthesis. The A portion ADP ribosylates an initiation, an, e an elongation factor for translation, EEF2. It stops host cell protein synthesis and kills the cell. Cholera toxin is composed of a single A subunit and five B subunits. This toxin elevates intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate in the epithelium of the small intestine, and that causes movement of fluid into the lumen and the classic diarrhea associated with cholera. And finally, the anthrax toxin, the highly lethal anthrax toxin, is composed of 2A and a B subunit, and again, the B subunit binds the cell receptor. Two toxins that are well known, botulinum toxin produced by C. botulinum and tetanus toxin produced by C. tetani clostridium are neurotoxins. These toxins elaborated by the bacteria at different sites make their way through the circulatory system and the lymph system to the brain where they cause their effects. Tetanus toxin, for example, causes muscles to contract uncontrollably and they cause what we call spastic paralysis. On the other hand, botulinum toxin blocks muscle contractions, so the muscles get flaccid. This is called flaccid paralysis. So two very different effects on the central nervous system. The type three cytotoxins we mentioned briefly before, they're shown on the right-hand part of this screen. They are injected by the bacterium into the host cell by a type 3 secretion apparatus. Bacteria have a number of different kinds of secretion apparati 
which are used to inject effector molecules into the host cell to get them to do what they want. And these have their own ways of altering the biochemistry of the cell to cause pathology. Type 3 cytotoxins are found in a wide range of bacteria, for example, Salmonella, Shigella, Pseudomonas, Cholera, and the plague bacilli all produce type 3 toxins of various sorts, and we'll mention a few of these and how they work in a few moments. Another toxin, and a very important one, produced by gram-negative bacteria is endotoxin. Now, if you don't remember what a gram-negative bacteria is, go back to the introductory bacteria lecture and take a look. Endotoxin is sort of like the calling card of gram-negative bacteria. It announces to the host, I'm here, and you better watch out. The endotoxin is nothing more than lipopolysaccharide, that outer layer on the outer membrane of a gram-negative bacteria. So that outer layer is a lipid bilayer, but the outer layer is unusual. It's not the standard kind of lipid. It's made of lipopolysaccharide, and that is what is endotoxin. Now, despite the name endotoxin, this toxin is not internalized into the host cell. It remains extracellularly. It just happens to be the name that has stuck over the years. Let's look in closer at that outer membrane, that lipopolysaccharide. Here it is in some detail. Remember, at the very bottom, there are lipid chains that form the outer le leaflet of that membrane and that component is called lipid A. That's the active component of endotoxin. That is what has the biological effect. And then there are other portions, including the O portion that we talked about, which extends above, completing lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide is recognized by pattern re recognition receptors located on the surface of the eukaryotic cell. We all have such receptors in order to, for us to recognize what is foreign. And when foreign molecules are recognized, the result is a production of cytokines, which mobilize the immune response, but may also have detrimental properties. So on the left of this slide are three pattern recognition receptors, one of which uh, recognizes LPS, that portion of the outer membrane of bacteria that we've just been talking about. Another one, FLA, recognizes flagellin, the protein that makes up the flagella of bacteria that helps them to move. So here's a close-up look of the pattern recognition receptor, and it, again, recognizes endotoxin as being present, initiates cytokine synthesis, and depending on how much endotoxin is present, low or high, it has different effects on the cell. So you can imagine that early in infection, it has one kind of effect where the endotoxin is low, and then if the infection proceeds unchecked, you'll have higher concentration of endotoxin, you will have a very different effect. These receptors for endotoxin and other bacterial products are called innate receptors. They also sense viral infections as well. So at low concentrations of endotoxin, there are a variety of effects, many of which reflect the attempts at the immune system of eliminating the bacterial and infection. So let's take a look at some of these. You can see the four different targets here and the ultimate activities and effects of endotoxin. At low concentrations, endotoxin targets Kupfer cells, macrophages of various sorts. It causes release of cytokines when it binds to its receptor. Cytokines are produced, and some of those cytokines cause fever. So endotoxin is well known to be pyrogenic, fever-inducing. The mechanism is by being recognized by that innate receptor and producing uh, a cytokine that induces fever. Cytokines, endotoxin also activates macrophages. It makes them more phagocytic. It makes them secrete hydrolases and have just more enhanced killing. The idea being, of course, uh, there's endotoxin here. We sense it. There must be a gram-negative. We're going to kill it. So we're going to get activated. At low concentrations, 
endotoxin also activates neutrophils. This has an effect of dilating blood vessels and allowing immune cells to come in and clear any infections that may be present. Endotoxin also activates B lymphocytes. The lymphocytes, of course, produce antibodies, and these may be useful for clearing the infection. And finally, at low concentrations, endotoxin also activates the complement system, which, whose goal is many-fold, essentially trying to get rid of the bacterial infection. Complement can help uh, take up bacteria into macrophages by opsonization. It can increase capillary permeability, and it can also poke holes into bacteria. All of this is part of the inflammatory response to infection. Now, in contrast, at very high levels of endotoxin, it often can result in shock, fluid loss, for example, caused by too many cytokines, and disseminated intravascular clotting or coagulation. There are other membrane-damaging toxins as well, uh, lipases, for example, enzymes that digest lipids. An example is the lecithinase from clostridial species. This enzyme can lyse cells and eliminate defenses and provides nutrients for bacteria. These are bacterial toxins lysing eukaryotic cells to avoid defenses, and the lysed cells produce nutrients for the bacteria. Hemolysins can lyse red and white blood cells, and then there are toxins that form pores in the cell membrane. They insert into the membrane, they allow water to flow in, and the cell bursts. Again, a way for bacteria to avoid some of those immune cells that are trying to get rid of the bacteria. We also have what are called heterogeneous pore-forming toxins. These are produced by a variety of bacteria. One well-known one is streptolysin O, produced by the streptococci. This pore-forming toxin binds cholesterol and damages liposomes in cells of the host, causes the cells to lyse, part of the reason why tissues are damaged. Another set of toxins that are produced, and if you're thinking, boy, bacteria make a lot of toxins, you're right. This is their modus operandus. These are called extracellular matrix toxins. The extracellular matrix is the area between cells. Here on this picture, we're showing two cells, and the area between them and below them. This is filled with all kinds of substances that provide protection and hold the cell together. This is the extracellular matrix. Bacteria produce enzymes called hyaluronidase. Hyaluronic acid is a component of the extracellular matrix, as you can see here, and this breaks it down. It breaks down connective tissue, allowing bacteria to spread better. Streptokinase is an enzyme produced by streptococci. It activates plasminogen, converts it to plasmin, which then attacks blood clots and gets them to dissolve. Bacteria don't like blood clots because it inhibits them from moving about and may restrict them. So this enzyme takes care of that. And finally, collagenases and elastases also digest the extracellular matrix, allowing free flow movement of the bacteria. <music>